Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tip scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so thrilled to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, Child and Teen Development Specialist, author, and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who give me the opportunity to love, learn, and grow every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but we're in this together, and thankfully, we have a lot of wonderful people we can count on who can help us and give us the insight we need along the way. Friendship can be a beautiful part of life. We laugh, we cry, we play, we talk, we experience life with friends as we're growing up. I mean, thinking back to our childhood, don't you remember these incredible experiences that all involve friends? But that doesn't mean that friendship is a simple construct, and it certainly isn't always easy. There are important skills that kids have to develop in order to make and keep friends. How do they make friends? How do they learn to understand their friends' feelings? How do they learn to be part of a group and still maintain their own individuality? And how do they let go and forgive or even leave a friendship if they need to? For these questions and more, we are turning to Dr. Eileen Kennedy Moore. Now, Dr. Eileen is a clinical psychologist based in Princeton, New Jersey, and a mom of four. Her newest book is Growing Friendships, A Kid's Guide to Making and Keeping Friends. Isn't that perfect? She has also written two books for parents, Smart Parenting for Smart Kids and The Unwritten Rules of Friendship plus an audio video series from the great courses called Raising Emotionally and Socially Healthy Kids. She's a trusted expert on parenting and child development. Dr. Kennedy Moore speaks at schools and conferences and is often featured in major major media. You can learn all about Dr. Eileen at EileenKennedyMoore.com and check out her friendship advice for kids at DrFriendTastic.com. Such an important topic with someone who has really devoted an important part of her career to helping kids master the art and emotions of friendship. I want to thank you, Dr. Eileen, for joining us on How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Thank you, Robin. I'm delighted to be here. We are so glad you're here. But before we get into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't had the opportunity and the pleasure of meeting you, of reading your books, of being in your office, would you just take a moment to tell us what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in helping kids learn how to make and keep friends? Well, Robin, when my family, when I was growing up, my family moved around about every three years. Mm. So at a very young age, I became an expert on making friends. I kind of had to. As an adult, uh, well, I have four kids, which, as you know, they're all different. They all have their unique strengths and weaknesses Mm -hmm. and and challenges. Mm -hmm. So that was really fun for me to see their different ways of approaching the social world. And I'm also a clinical psychologist, so I work with kids and families every day. And what I hear more than everything, anything from both parents and from kids is about concerns about friendships. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, your book, the most recent one, goes over so much of how to make and keep friends in such a an accessible and beautiful way for kids. Oh, thank you. I love the cartoons. I love the advice you provide. It's very hands-on. The tips are great. But because we have parents and educators and coaches listening, what can key adults do in the lives of children to help kids make friends? 
there's a lot we can do. Now, of course, we can't make friends for our mm-hmm. kids, but we can definitely lay the groundwork and smooth the way for them to make those all important relationships. The first thing that we have to look at is our modeling because kids are watching us. They're watching how we interact with them, how we interact with our partners, our spouses. They're watching how we interact with the clerk at the grocery store. All of that shows them how to treat other people. Mm-hmm. And if we're not getting that part right, no matter what we say, it's not going to make up for it. Mm -hmm. So the first step is modeling. The second step is to create opportunities for kids to be around other children, Mm -hmm. doing fun things. So this could involve one-on-one playdates in your home. It could also involve after-school activities, Mm -hmm. being on a sports team together or um, being part of a music program or a gymnastics program. This is terrific because kids are spending fun time together. Another thing that's really important is to do some empathy training. If you look at child development all the way from the toddler years to the teen years, what fuels that that shift from the love the one you're with kind of friendship of the little kids to the deeper and more loyal friendships of the older kids is an increasing ability to understand and care about somebody else's perspective. Mm-hmm. So we as an adults, can help open their their eyes to how somebody else might be thinking or feeling or reacting to what they're doing. And that's very, very helpful. Right. Right. When we can do that, no matter what adult we are, whether we're a parent or we're a coach on the on the playing field or indoors, anybody, any educator can help out and point out feelings, uh, ask children some key questions. We did talk to Michelle Borba, who does a lot on empathy, and and, uh, and she did some really good work on that. And I really can understand what you're saying, how important it is for us to make sure that our kids are getting those friendship cues in terms of what people are feeling, how they are feeling, and how they can help others. Right. And then the other thing that's really important is we as an adults, uh, as adults have an observer perspective on what our kids are doing. Mm -hmm. So we can also offer important feedback and guidance about how to do it right. So here's an example. A lot of times, I see this a lot with, especially with bright kids. So they come up to a friend and, or they come up to an adult and they say, I can do this, I can do that. (laughs) And the adult is charmed, right? And they say, oh, isn't that wonderful? So then the child tries the same thing with a peer, Mm. except the peer is not charmed. (laughs) (laughs) No, not impressed. (laughs) No, in fact, they say, who cares? Or Mm -hmm. quit bragging. And the child feels hurt. Now, it may seem like this kid is showing off or conceited, but really what's happening is the child hasn't learned that the way to approach adults is different Mm. from the way to approach children. Mm -hmm. With peers, we have to approach them as equals. And if you're talking about something that's true only of you, that has nothing to do with friendship. So instead, what we want to do is help our kids to, say, approach with a compliment, a nice yes. shot, or, ooh, I like the way your picture turned out, or to ask interested questions like what or how, to look for that common ground. Yes. What did you think of the new movie? Um, how, how was your soccer game yesterday? And that shows interest, and it's building on that common ground, which is where friendships begin. Oh, I love the idea of common ground because, you know, kids love to look at commonalities. You know, what's the same? What do you see that's the same? Do you notice that girl has the same sneakers as you, (laughs) right? Don't you have that shirt at home? Um, Oh, and don't you love that book that he's reading over there? And and it, it can help point it out. And then what do we do then? Do we help encourage them to go forward and, and, and say something to those kids then? Yes, because the first, the first step in friendship is to show openness to friendship. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to signal that we like them. We yes. want to spend more time with them. We're interested. It, this could begin with a greeting. Mm -hmm. So shy children often have trouble with this. And what they do is somebody will say hi to them or just be near them. And what they'll do is they'll look down and maybe mumble something. (laughs) (laughs) 
And they're focused on their own distress, but what they're communicating to the other kid is, I don't like you and I don't want anything to do with you. Right, right. And, and I like the idea of, of making sure that you're looking for a way to get in with them by making the other person feel good. We're back to that empathy piece again. Exactly. So this is something that you can rehearse with your kid. Use role play. And a friendly greeting involves looking the person in the eye, smiling because you're happy to see them, saying hello or hi. Or, and if you can, say their name because right. that makes the greeting personal. It's like, I'm happy to see you, not just whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> What's your face? Right. right. Okay. And yes, we talk about a powerful greeting when we're talking about, you know, hello, my name is, if you're just introducing them in the beginning, right? You're introducing yourself. Hello, my name is Robin. Um, it's nice to meet you. And then putting in maybe one of your questions or a compliment, like, oh, I really like your shirt or, um, or I, you're such a fast runner. Or, I love the way you dribble. You can dribble that ball and get it into the basket. Um, or, or maybe even a question like, how are you? Or what are you up to? Right? Or can I play? Which is a big one for the young ones, right? Well, be careful about that can I play mm -hmm. question. Because what, pre so researchers have done these studies where they've videotaped kids on a playground. Yeah. I don't know how they got permission to do this, but they did. And it's good because they got, they've learned a bit that there's a very specific sequence about how to join mm -hmm. a group at play. Yes. I love this part of your book too. Oh, good. So what we need to do or what kids need to do is watch and then blend. Yes. So watch what the kids are doing and then slide into the action without interrupting. Mm. So usually it is not a good idea to wander up and say, hi, I'm Sarah. Can I play too? Mm. Because think about it. What's going to happen? The kids have to stop what they're doing, turn around, look at your kid, decide whether they want your kid to join. And this is just too much of an opening for the mischievous kids who could say, no, you can't play. Ha, 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 ha. Mm -hmm. So... For the young kids, I actually don't recommend introducing themselves right away mm -hmm. or saying, can I play? Watch what they're doing and then enter with a compliment, with the focus on them mm -hmm. or support their activity in some way. So if they're playing a sports game and um, one team is losing, most kids are going to want to join the winning team. Don't. No. <laughs> join the, kid, the team that's losing because they'll appreciate your help. Right. So again, empathy. We're thinking about how will this feel for the other person? Right. So a lot of times kids who struggle socially or kids who struggle with these entry um, issues will do the things that draw attention to themselves. Mm -hmm. And the research tells us that is absolutely wrong. For instance, let's say a bunch of boys are sitting around and they're playing with their Pokemon cards. And then our kid wanders up and says, I hate Pokemon cards. I mean, they're just printed pictures on cardboard. They're so stupid. This is like there's a little melody going along. La, 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 la. And this, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right. It is not a good idea because this kid has just put a big neon sign above his head saying, I don't belong here. Oh, gosh. Oh, and we don't want you here because that I stinks. Exactly, exactly. So he either has to um, join in their enthusiasm mm -hmm. for those right. cards. And if he doesn't know about them, that's okay. He can say, wow, you have a lot of them. Or, ooh, you have a cool one. Mm -hmm. or, um, so to, something to show interest right. and enthusiasm to match the tone of the group. Or he can find another group where they all hate Pokemon cards and then his <laughs> comment fits right in. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Oh, I love happens. that idea. Okay. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think what you're saying is that we can then do these types of role plays with our kids, especially those who are a little bit challenged in these areas who keep making the same mistake, right? Like they keep making the same mistake. Let's let's role play it. And, and for those who are just in the beginnings of things, maybe they do feel a little insecure about approaching a group. These are great ways to, to practice when it's just you and your child. 
Right. And here's another situation that comes up. So all the kids are coming out and they're complaining about the social studies test. And this one says, oh, my gosh, it was so hard. And the other one says, I didn't know the answer to 14. And then our girl comes up and says, well, I thought it was easy. No, no. <laughs> it, just let the air right out of the balloon. Right. Exactly. So now this doesn't mean that she should lie or right. pretend that she's stupid, right. because obviously deceit is not a good way to build a relationship. Mm -hmm. But she can match the emotional tone of the group. So she could say something like, I can't believe there were four short answers. Mm, right, right. Something maybe that she didn't find to be the best thing ever about the test. Right, exactly, okay. exactly. So it's not about being fake. It's about being sensitive. It's about being aware of other people's feelings and joining them. Mm. These are great tips. And I, I love that you're getting really inter intricate with you know, what to say and what to do here, because I think people need to know, okay, like, don't lead with, can I play? Let's look for a way that you can approach and blend in. I always love the dance that kids do right before they meet each other and become friends. You're like, you have two kids who are sitting on a beachfront, let's say, making sandcastles, but they're separate. And then you start to see them sort of look at each other and then they kind of move a little closer. And, you know, eventually they kind of smile, they make eye contact. And then somebody might say, uh, I found this leaf. I'm going to put it on top of my sandcastle. Do you want one? And, Perfect. Right, right. And, <laughs> That's and you glorious. start to see it. Like, I, I mean, I just, I'm thinking of my daughter who, who you know, sometimes has that kind of situation on vacation or my son who has that, you know, rock collections or whatever on vacation and somehow meets people who, who also like that. But it's, it's interesting to see that dance. And I don't know that we always talk about the dance. The dance is where you kind of are finding the space to blend in. I mean, really, right. that's what it is. Right. They're finding that common ground. Mm -hmm. Kids make friends by doing fun things together. When we adults can facilitate that, we open the doors to friendship for them. Mm -hmm. I'm even thinking of the kid who's like the waiting for the, the game to just stop for a second and the ball comes kind of rolling towards him or her, you know, and they pick up the ball and, and hand it back to the kids that somehow it's again that dance, right? That he's exactly. involved, but not, and helping, or she's involved in helping, but not, you know, jumping in and crushing the game. So, the so. other thing that's really important is to pick the right people mm -hmm. to be friends with. Right. Sometimes kids decide they want to be friends with the most popular yes. kid in the class. Yes, yes, of course. That may or may not be a good match. Right. So you really want to be thinking about what do you have in common? Where is the common ground? And if you don't like to do the same things as the most popular kid in the class, probably you're not going to become friends. Mm -hmm. Right. And it may not be a good match because they are like somebody else might be extremely exuberant and love to play outside and, and that kind of thing. And then you, you have a child who, who's mainly very quiet, likes to play indoors. I mean, we have to look at those kinds of things because if the common ground isn't there, then the friendship may not really be able to develop unless you've got opposites attract and somehow they kind of pull at each other in a really positive way, which is sometimes we see. Well, there has to be the common ground first mm -hmm. and then the opposites they can compensate for each other. Good point. Good point. One of one of the most robust findings from research on children's friendship is that similarity is what draws them together. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think that's a great point and uh, important for, for kids to know as well as adults. So when we have a friend, so our child has a friend or a series of friends, what should we do and what should you know we do help our kids do when they're having a conflict with a friend? That's a great question, Robin, because it's going to come up. Yeah. Nobody's <laughs> it's perfect. A, no right. friendship is perfect. And there's even some research saying that friends argue as much, if not more, than non-friends. Mm, interesting. Uh, yes. yes. So part of that is just because they spend more time together. But fortunately, friends are more likely to resolve those conflicts in ways that allow the relationship to maintain. So 
when our kid comes home and they're, they're all upset about a big argument with a friend, our number one job as parents is to just comfort, yes. is to just emphasize. And we can say things like, that must have been really upsetting for you, or you're really mad that she did that, mm. or it hurt your feelings when he said that. So just reflect, reflect, mm-hmm. reflect. Nice sounding and, board. A sounding exactly. board for their feelings and their thoughts. Okay. Right. So... You may have in your mind, because of your careful observation of your child, lots of ideas. Well, you know, well, didn't I tell you that this was going to be a problem if you kept on this way? (laughs) Not a good move, probably, right? Not at this time. (laughs) When your child is hurting, first they need to have you just on their side, Mm -hmm. just as a source of comfort. So then the other thing that we need to do, the next step, is to discourage retaliation. Sometimes mm-hmm. when kids are hurt or angry, they want to get even sure, with, sure. with the other kid. And that's human nature, but it's not the kind thing to do, and it's not the right thing to do. So we want to discourage them from, say, relational bullying, you know, telling it, spreading gossip mm-hmm. about um, someone or, you know, trying to get everybody to turn against this, this other kid. Mm-hmm. That's not kind and it's not right, and they need to hear that from us. Mm-hmm. The other thing that we can do is to encourage relationship repair. Now, we adults tend to want everybody to talk everything out, but research tells us that that is not, compromise and negotiation is not the primary way that kids resolve conflict until age 19. How interesting, very interesting. Right, now that doesn't mean that the younger kids can't do it, Mm -hmm. but it's harder and it's not their go-to strategy. Usually, the way kids resolve conflicts is they separate for a little bit, and then they rejoin and just be nice to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like nothing happened at times, right? Right, exactly. So just let tempers cool and then try again. So I've I've had kids in my practice who are worried, oh, we had this big argument, that's it, Uh, the friendship is over forever. And I'm like, no, why don't you try tomorrow? Just Mm -hmm. be nice to him. And usually it, they kind of mm-hmm. get past it. Right, right. They find yes. a new common ground. Exactly. Right. And they have fun together yes. again. Yes, yes. And it's, it really is a, a matter of kindness and generosity, of you being a good friend, mm-hmm. if you can let go of those past grievances. So important and so challenging at times. It for, is. For adults, but I guess maybe for kids, it's a... They, you know, a day goes by and it feels maybe a little bit longer than it does for adults <laughs> because uh, I think kids can do that pretty well. They really can. So I had a client once who the mom was saying, um, well, why don't you play with the boy down the street? And the kid responded something like, no, because two years ago when we were oh. in travel basketball together, he never passed. Oh, no. <laughs> So I actually have a list of forgiveness guidelines that I use for kids. How lovely. And so if it happened more than a month ago, let it go. Let it go. If it happened just once and it's never likely to happen again, let it go. Nice. If it's if the person sincerely apologized Mm. for whatever it was, Mm -hmm. let it go. If they didn't mean it, it was an accident or they just didn't realize let it go. I love these. I love those. I feel like adults, like you can have those written out and put them up on a refrigerator. You can put them, you know, up in your classrooms. You can put these around so that kids know forgiveness is such an important part of friendship and of all relationships. And I feel like, you know, these young friendships are really you know, foundational to how kids learn to be a good friend, but also how to be in all relationships as they grow older. Absolutely. Robin, that is one of the things that I love the most about studying children's friendships. It's not like kids learn this all at age nine and then they're done. Mm -hmm. Even even as adults in new relationships or new situations, we're continuing to learn about getting along Mm -hmm. with each other. So the forgiveness is important not only for the other kid, but also for ourselves because we don't want to be collecting Mm -hmm. grievances like beads on a string. Oh, so important. It makes us angry and upset and makes our stomach all clenched and it's not a good way of living. 
Right. So even if the other kid doesn't deserve the forgiveness, Mm -hmm. you give it because Mm -hmm. you do. You do. Oh, that was a quotable and beautiful. (laughs) Oh, that was beautiful. I I think that is something that we all need to learn, right? We all need to learn, even as adults, to forgive because it's helpful for our own health and well-being, not just the other person. Now, one thing that's really interesting about social skills is it's never about just doing one thing. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to flexibly adjust our behavior to fit the situation or fit the relationship. So as important as it is to forgive, sometimes we also need to be able to speak up. Yes. So if it's a situation that is coming up again and again and again, you may need to role play with your child about how to tell the friend that this isn't working for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. I I mean, and sometimes it's it's speaking up and sometimes it's letting go of that person who may not actually be a friend. I've had plenty of conversations with my kids and have asked them what does it really mean to be a friend to you? Mm -hmm. Give me some words that come to mind. And does this person match that? I even say that in my presentations. Give me your top three words and then think of your top friends and do they match that? And, And if the person doesn't, maybe they aren't really a friend. You know, that person right. who makes you feel bad every single day. Sure, there's social skills and there's people, okay, oh, I didn't know I was doing that. And then you can Right, and the assertiveness is important. Sure. But if you try to explain, yes. w- the question that I often ask is, how do you feel when you're with that yes. person? Yes, yes. And if they make you feel bad mm-hmm. and down and inadequate, that's not a good relationship. No, not healthy. Not healthy as a child and not healthy as an adult. Very true, very true. But a lot of times kids will cling to a not so healthy friendship For sure. because they're afraid of having no friends. Yes, they are. And this is another place where we adults can step in by creating more opportunities mm-hmm. for them to have friends. Yes. It's easier for them to fan the flames of a, a casual friendship mm-hmm. than to start from scratch with somebody. Yes. So make sure that your child, your child has opportunities to be around other kids doing fun things. Yes, I talk about diversifying our friendship circles. You know, sometimes uh-huh. there's um, there's somebody that I had interviewed who told me that you know when his his parent was able to you know get involved with different groups when he was younger and bring him to different places. He had friends in a lot of different nooks and crannies of town of the community. That when somebody was being nasty and mean and and you know really showing themselves not to be a friend the relationship was really dwarfed by the fact that he had friends in a lot of different pockets and and that it wasn't so that person was not his whole life and I think that's important yeah yes that's very important it can be enormously comforting for a child who's say struggling with kids at school to say and no my real friends are on the swim team yes that's and that is so you know it, it's it then would be important for our in, to not put all your eggs in one basket that I would imagine and say oh we're just gonna play with the kids at school and and that's it maybe you know getting on the team that might not be right in town or maybe um, getting involved with a community activity with kids who aren't right there at the school or maybe one or two people who you don't really know as well at school is are, are on that team or in that activity. Right. They're kind of a friendship safety net. Yes. And they may not be as intimate as the very close friend that you see every day mm-hmm. in school, but it is really important to have that safety net. Research tells us that among first graders, only about 50% of friendships last, the best friendships last from fall to spring. Interesting. Wow. And it, Right. So, and among fourth graders and eighth graders, one quarter of the friendships don't last. Oh, wow. The so there's a real year. ebb and flow then. It is. Now, fortunately, we know that kids who change close friends during the course of the school year are fine. Mm-hmm. You know, psychologically, they're on par with the other kids. So it's painful, but they can get through it. And we need to as parents have that broader perspective, not saying to your kid, you know, that friendship's not gonna last. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do have the broader perspective to know, you know, my kid needs other options mm-hmm. too. 
-hmm. even if they're not as close as the very closest friend, let's have other options as well. So for, for, for you and, and for all the work that you do, how do we know if we don't need to step in? Like, what are the signs that parents don't need to worry about their children's friendships and, and that some of these things are just normal? I think that's really important because we do need to trust our children's ability to grow and develop and learn. Mm -hmm. So the questions that I, my, my kind of diagnostic questions are, can your child interact happily with other kids under some circumstances when he or she wants to? Mm -hmm. so, so some kids are true introverts and they really need that alone time to recharge. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm-hmm. But we want that to be a choice, not something that they have no other options for. Uh -huh. So can they get along with other kids when they want to? A second question is, does your child have at least one relationship in which your child likes the other kid and the other kid likes them back? Mm -hmm. So a reciprocal friendship. Right. They don't have to be the most popular kid in school, but if they have one buddy who likes them back, that can help a lot. And then the third question is, does your child have someone to sit and chat with at lunch? Oh, yes. Lunch is a big deal. Lunch and recess. It is, yes. Lunch and recess. If you, you know, if there's something, if your child is alone during lunch and recess and you, and, and we're talking about not somebody who's saying by choice they need to recharge, but Typically, kids want to sit with somebody and they want to know they can play with somebody. That that might be a time to step in, right? Yes, to give some guidance. Sometimes kids shoot themselves in the foot. For example, I uh, it's common for certain kids to want to spend all of recess reading. Oh, good point. Yes, I my, one of my my daughter actually told me that one of her friends loves to read during recess. No. <laughs> so I'm an author of many books, but no, there's a time and a place. Right. And if your child is reading during lunch or recess, again, he's announcing to the other kids, I don't like you, you're boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's not... And it puts up a wall, right? right? It puts exactly. up a wall. Right. Exactly. And again, they have to know how to do this. I had a girl um, tell me once, I know how to make a, fr make a friend. And I said, great, how do you do that? And she says, well, what I do is I go to the edge of the playground and I look very very sad oh, no. and eventually everybody comes over oh so, no you don't exactly. want to play the victim oh <laughs> right. that's sad yes. so this might work once <laughs> but after that the kids would rather be doing soccer right. or playing tag or you know, running up and down the slide right. so and is there something to say about the kid who does that over and over again that it's a little bit sounds a little bit like crying wolf in some ways too right <laughs> And it's really, it's not building on the common ground. Yeah. It's not about shared fun. Right. It's about seeking attention. Right, it is. It's about the me, me, me. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, in your book, you give these amazing scenarios um, that help kids understand friendships. And I do love those situations. I just would love to bring up maybe one or two now so that you could tell us how we can deal with them as parents or educators sure. if we see them happening because you just are so I really feel like you're so gifted in these so I mean, here's a common one one of them in your book talks about the friendship tug of war so your child is being pulled in two different directions maybe one kid's like you can't play with the other person and the other one's like no you have to play with me and you can't play and they just feel like they can't the two can't get along but they both like your child so now your child is feeling like torn apart and doesn't want to deal with either one of them. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> but wants everybody to play together. At two. So right. What, what, if we see this happening or we, I mean, truthfully hear about it happening, our child comes home, they're upset. And I've heard these types of things before. My child's in second grade and, you know, first grade. I've heard these happening on the playground. What, what would you say to a parent or an educator who's seeing that happen or hearing that happen over and over? So is our kid the kid in the middle or yes. the kid? Okay, Let our, our kid, kid be the one in the middle, but you certainly could speak to the, uh, you know, the parent of one of the other ones too. 
Okay. So usually the solution that kids come up with is, well, I'll sit with you on Monday and Tuesday and you on Wednesday and Thursday. And some don't do that. That never works mm -hmm. because basically it's reinforcing the idea that you guys can't be together. Mm -hmm. And I am this bone for you to fight over, <laughs> <laughs> which is just not fun. Right. I think the best way to do it is to have a one-on-one, -on -one, encourage your child to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each person and say, I know it's uncomfortable for you, but when you refuse to play with that one, you're not being a good friend to me. Mm because you're putting me in a position of having to choose and I don't want to choose. Mm. So what important words, right? I mean, they're very assertive, but it also says like, I, I, I like you, right? I want right. to be with you, but I also want to be with this other person. Right. And I don't like being pull, fought over. Mm -hmm. That's not fair to me because it really isn't because mm -hmm. it makes it unpleasant for the kid in the middle. And I would have that with both, both, <laughs> tuggers <laughs> individually right and maybe even brainstorm with them what can we all do together the other possibility which i often recommend is triads are the threesome friendships That's are tough. very fun and very exciting but they're very precarious That's tough there's some right. tough dynamics there right so it's it's very easy for one person to feel left out yes. because you're not going to be able to balance everything exactly and wait i said four words to this one let me say four words to that one <laughs> oh, so that's that's not going to work Often, if you can introduce a fourth kid, oh. everything settles down. Right, right, because so, somebody has a partner. Right. Right. And, and it just kind of diffuses everything. Mm -hmm. So now it's oh. a group rather than just this tugging over one person. What a good thing for, for educators to know if they see it on the, on the blacktop outside or on the grass outside that it's, you know, three all the time because it, that would be great to know, oh, let me introduce a new person. Maybe they right. can play Or two together. new people. If or it's two. for five, some, that's okay too, you know, but right. to, just kind of to, to diffuse the intensity of fighting over the one girl. Now the girl in the middle, and I'm saying girl because it usually is, um, the girl in the middle may have trouble doing this because they're often flattered. It's like, oh, you each oh, want to play with me. Good point. Good point. <laughs> so, but I, I don't usually hear complaints from the girl in the middle. I hear complaints from one of the tuggers. Oh, okay. And what did the tuggers say? It's not fair. Oh. She's she's dumping me. You know, she's oh. spending time with that one, oh. and of course, they're horribly jealous. So they hate the other one's guts. Yes. Uh, and what I would recommend here is try to befriend the other tugger. Sure. Because then the rivalry will settle down. The um, center girl becomes less important. Mm -hmm. And it's an act of kindness towards the middle girl if you can really embrace her other friends. Mm -hmm. And okay. also get a fourth. <laughs> get a fourth. Yes. Well, you, so that was like a classic situation that, yes, you, you're right. It often happens with girls. But let's do one that I, I say it would often happen with boys, but of course happens with girls too, for sure. Right. There's always an overlap. There's always, I mean, of course. The, in your book, you talk about these stop signals. So I want to know if you, is before we end up, what are the stop signals and what do you do with the kid who just takes things too far and doesn't get the stop signals in friendship? Right. This is this is a very common and very challenging situation. So I'll give you an example. A kid says something and it's not funny. So he says it eight more yes. times, hoping yes. it will become funny, which of course it never does. <laughs> so kids like the idea of being funny. Yes, they do. And, and frankly, we all like being around somebody who gives us a good laugh. Mm -hmm. The problem is humor is a very risky social strategy. It could be big payoff, but if you're just a little bit off, and let me tell you, all of my clients are just a little bit off. Right, right, right. Sure. It is not funny. It is annoying. Yes. And then people get furious. And so they better, say you're being annoying, and they, they still do. do. Right. They do. And so a, a better strategy is to try to be kind instead. It's really hard to mess up kindness. And we also have to teach our kids to be alert to those stop signals. Kids tend to be very blunt about how they say stop, quit it, cut it out. You're being annoying. Mm -hmm. When tell your child 
when you hear one of those, you have to stop mm-hmm. because otherwise you're saying to the other kid, I don't care. How yes. You're yes, that's so, right. Now, it's hard for kids to stop on a dime. So you may have to give them particular strategies of how to do that. It could be sit on your hands Mm -hmm. or cross your legs at the ankle or pretend your tongue is stuck to the roof of your mouth Mm -hmm. so so that you're not saying something. Or maybe just move away from the person a little bit so that they have some, some elbow room and you're not quite on top of them. Respecting that personal space is really important. And this is a way of taking care of your friends. I had a kid just recently who um, came in and said, "Um, this kid bullied me today. I said, oh, what happened? And he said, he told me, quit being so annoying. (laughs) Quit making that annoying noise. (laughs) That is not bullying. (laughs) (laughs) That's a stop signal, and you need to listen to it. (laughs) I think those are really important, and, and I like the idea of, giving our kids strategies because if we just say you need to stop some kids can't do that you know and some kids really need some some help in that area so instead of telling them to stop tell them to do something i like that idea in this case when you hear that sit on your hands when you hear that move away when you do that get your tongue stuck to the top of your mouth because it will help you to stop and i i think that's that's so much more liberating Right. Then, then just stop. Yeah, another thing to have them say is, okay, I'll stop now. Oh, that's good. So that gives them that extra three seconds of breaking room. Okay. So it's a little bit awkward, but yeah. the people hear that you're trying, and it's much better than persisting in whatever the annoying behavior Beautiful. is. Beautiful. Beautiful. So out of all, I mean, you've given us so many tips, and you've given us incredible scripting, but out of all the things that you've said, or maybe you haven't said, what would you say is the top tip that you would want the listeners to come away with for, for today about kids and making and keeping friends? Kindness is the key to friendship. Mm. So we want to help our kids to imagine things from someone else's perspective and to make the kind choice of taking care of that friend. It's beautiful. And I, I do love what you said about it's hard to mess up kindness. I think that's a beautiful way of saying that. Be kind. It's hard to mess up kindness. It's a it's a beautiful go-to for kids. And, and using your heart, being empathetic, and oh, those forgiveness skills were amazing. So but you can also ask our kids, what would be the kind thing to do in this situation? Yes. So let them think it through. Yes. Now, sometimes kids do take it too far and will give away money or possessions. Sure. Yes. That doesn't work. And that's not really kindness because you're thinking about what can I get? Yes. Right. The other kids will take it because they're kids, but they will lose respect for your child. Mm. So focus on that common ground of having fun together. Such good tips and really important scenarios that we went over today that I think a lot of people have seen, they know. I've talked to many educators who have told me that they would love to get some strategies on how to get a kid to stop doing an annoying behavior. So maybe (laughs) they'll apply that same thing in a, in a different way. Uh, but I love that you, you provided them for our friendship talk today. Can you give everybody the resource of the week? How can they find out more about you and your books, your, your speaking engagements? I know you speak at schools and what you're up to. Well, the main website that I have is EileenKennedyMoore.com, and that covers everything. (laughs) But the main resource that I'd like to share is a new website I created for kids called Mm DrFriendTastic.com. And one of the things that I know as both a mom and a psychologist is that the way to reach kids is through humor. So there are plenty of social skills books out there that are very preaching, like, be nice. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> but mine is specific and it's also funny. Yes. So we the we have cartoons ab- about common friendship problems and then the narrator comes in and gives research-based tips about here's what's going on, here's what you should do. Yes. But the stars of the book are this cat and dog yes. character. They're, They're hilarious. Wander- oh, they wander through the text making silly comments like, yes. he should sniff their butts. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so How do you make a friend? Sniff their butts. <laughs> <laughs> so drfrentastic.com is a website that has 
um, friendship ad- questions and advice. It also has silly quizzes along the lines of, your friend doesn't want to play with you at recess today. You should, A, yell, you traitor, B, <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> uh, and if you go to the parents and teachers section of that, you'll also see um, the link to my new book, Growing Friendships. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Eileen Kennedy Moore, thank you so very much for joining us today and talking about how to help kids make and keep friends. Your tips are so important, so useful, evergreen. I mean, anybody could use these. And I think it's important for them to start early, um, do it consistently, because when our kids understand friendships and get some of these skills early on, they certainly can become really good friends as time goes on and apply them to all the relationships in their lives. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Robin. Well, I've got my takeaways, and sweet friends, I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. Let's go to facebook.com slash Dr. Robin Silverman, or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash Dr. Robin. And we are forming a new private How to Talk to Kids About Anything Facebook group. And then we can go into more detail about these podcasts and specific questions we have about specific kids, our kids, kids we work with. It's going to be lots of fun and extremely helpful and interesting to all of us. Just ask to be part of it. Oh, and if you love this podcast like I did, would you kindly go up to iTunes and rate and review it, share it, let people know about it? Because the more we learn about these outstanding solutions and use them in our own homes, the better off we will all be. I truly appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even when it seems like nothing is going right, and we all have those days, you've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. And on the days when we fall short, never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting, it's the ultimate do-over. I get it. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet sanity, please know you're 10 times the parent you think you are. You really are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connected through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.